Hello everyone. My name is Chidmebi in Jaku Brown. Welcome to a series focusing on West African history and myths. I am a researcher of West African histories and mythologies and a card carrying member of the Smithsonian Libraries and the Library of Congress, especially the African sections. While we focus on West Africa for now, in future, you, the listeners, can suggest periods in history or cultures that you want me to look at. For now, please enjoy this first episode. Full disclaimer, when it comes to the myths of the cultures and tribes that we come across, they are not fully unified, and tellings will vary from place to place even within the same tribe or culture. The other issue is largely pre-colonial history and the method of history recording. For most cultures, the pre-colonial history was either oral, set a song, or if it was indeed written down, it was done so in a very biased and storied fashion. Thus, my goal in this series, when it comes to the history is extracting the logical points of history and using sources from both factions of the various cultures in order to get a better idea of what the cultures were like. These will not go in any historical order for the most part. These will be slices of history and myth. Episode 0 The Fight for Bonnie When we think of colonial campaigns, what comes to mind tends to be British troops marching in, winning one-sided battles against those they conquered, as is shown in many documentaries and movies. However, history is complicated and never so simple. Take the Isle of Bonny as an example of more strategic tactics the British Empire employed. Today, this island, just off the coast of the Bight of Bonny, situated between southeast Nigeria and the islands of Sao Tome and Principe, played a large strategic role even before the age of the transatlantic slave trade and affected a lot of Africa's history to come. We do not officially know when the island itself became inhabited, but the oldest pottery and the construction sites on the island date habitation at slightly before 1000 CE. The artifacts found match those of the early Ibani kingdom, now called the Kingdom of Bani today, suggesting this kingdom of the Ijo tribe was expanding outwards, focusing on making ports and naval bases for trade. However, based on recent burial sites and an examination of the language families present on the island. It appears that while the island kingdom of Bonny became dominant with Ijaz, they were not the original peoples of the island. Those people are referred to in Ija tongue as the Finima people. But, however long they had resided, they were eventually overtaken by the Ibani kingdom and absorbed into their body politic. From oral and written records, the island kingdom of Bonny was allowed semi-autonomous rule from its parents' kingdom as long as it properly maintained trade. It would bring wealth and was an easy drop-enough point for goods such as palm oil. Indeed, the island's importance became greater for the future of what would become Nigeria when the residents of the island kingdom encountered the Portuguese in the early 15th century. What helped Bonnie's growth was its rather strategic location. Surrounded by rivers on all sides, it was rather hard to invade outright unless you had a strong naval presence. Seen as how most of the other tribes did not have the easy access to the ocean and rivers as the Ejars themselves as a group did, it allowed them to dominate in the port and naval business as well as make a lot of coastal raids. It also meant that the fishing industry was very exquisite as they were one of the most advanced naval powers 
in the small region of West Africa that they inhabited. To set the stage for what comes later, we need to delve deeper into the political structure of the Ibani Kingdom and its neighboring fellow Ijaw kingdoms. The king of the Ibani Kingdom was not an absolute ruler. Him and his descendants were indeed the primary rulers, but the Ibani Kingdom also had noble houses which were each led by lesser kings and chieftains, from whom the central king would have to curry favor from. Most of these noble houses claim descent from the first founding families of the Ibani Kingdom and were called Duawaris, led by an Aseme Alapu, which was their title for chieftain. The five original houses were Alagbariga, Awusa, Oakba, later changed to Dublin after European intervention, Tolofari, and Boye Omoso. The king of the land was referred to as the Amanyanabo, or one who owns the land, and the first five houses and their rulers, with each house head, being called Amadapu. This system was later expanded upon in 1785 by King Perikule I, as the kingdom slowly expanded to appease the other houses for their support. The culture believed that these houses had a divine claim to the land, and any succession thus was preordained. This allowed the houses to have a firm grasp on power for multiple generations and blocking attempts by the merchant caste to rise up. This made it easy for the Portuguese to trade with them, as it was easy to negotiate with smaller central authorities than with different merchants. Thus, the kingdom, growing from five Diwari houses to adding nine supplemental chieftain houses, and then 20 other minor houses, which all exist to this day in a ceremonial role. Several of these houses would sometimes found other Ijaw kingdoms themselves. Thus the Ijaw, as a tribe, became a loose confederacy of kingdoms. The Portuguese Empire maintained good relations with the kingdom, with even a diplomatic visit to Portugal occurring in 1450 CE by then Prince Abagé of Ibani. Portuguese ministers made it their mission to spread Roman Catholicism to the island and its fellow Ijaw kingdoms, and was initially successful, as Christianity brought the allure of goods not normally accessible to the various Ijaw states of the time. Over time, the Portuguese Empire fell to the wayside, and the Dutch and British empires made their way to the ports of both the island of Bonny, as well as the greater kingdom of Bonny. The Dutch and British took over and split control of the ports between themselves, using it for the infamous transatlantic slave trade. This trade devastated the shoreline tribes and kingdoms, as the kingdom of Bonny, already being skilled in coastal raiding, would commit raids for the European powers to get slaves and thus allow the Ibani Kingdom space to expand its territory in the process. This brought the greatest economic boom for the island as it lorded its wealth over the other nearby islands between 1529 and 1859. This economic wealth allowed the various noble houses to turn the island into a beacon not just for Christianity, including both Roman Catholicism and Anglicanism, but by building a lot of academic institutions and having primary access to a lot of technology before it would reach the west of mainland West Africa. The Ibani Kingdom was able to use this for negotiating power, as by making itself a cultural center, it would invite nobles from the other tribes and kingdoms surrounding it to send their scholars and children there to learn.
The greatest economic blow to the island came in 1807. By this point in time, the Dutch powers lost their power in the area, leaving the British as the sole interested party in this particular region. The British Empire officially banned slave trade, but as stated before, slaves were still transported through the island up till 1859. This is due to a lot of the nobility in the kingdom, basing a lot of their political and economic power in the trade, and had no desire to see their source of income disappear. So they would try to sneak slaves to the New World, imports that were not controlled by the British Empire. To this end, the British increased their number of patrol ships in the Bight of Bonny to catch slaving ships, often disguised as merchant vessels. This increased tensions between the various noble houses in both the main kingdom and the island, both for and against the established British consulate at the various ports. The smaller noble houses, which had been previously been plying in palm oil and other resources, were able to rise higher against those that were exclusively trading in slaves. Thus, they would send some of their own vessels to aid the Royal Navy in catching slave ships as it helped them put down their rivals. The biggest change to the internal politics of the island would come in 1830 with the ascension of William Dapper Pepple I of Ibani. This coincided with the appointment of a new foreign secretary in London named Henry John Temple Palmerston who would pursue more aggressive economic policies for British interests in Africa. Palmerston increased the size of the Royal Navy presence in West Africa, encouraging privateers and British companies to increase their expeditions in West Africa, as he wanted to have direct control over the resources instead of having to trade with the locals. This started to push the local traders out of the various businesses, causing increased tensions further. Things were further hampered in all of the Ibani territories and their fellow Ija neighboring kingdoms when William Dapper Pepple started to become ill of health, affecting his mental state and his ability to rule, which the British slowly began to take advantage of as he did not resist their demands as strongly as previous rulers had done before. This gave other houses and nobility the idea to take matters into their own hands as they tried to push against Palmerston's foreign policies and seize full control of the island of Bonny for the Bonny Kingdom. Thus, we have the stage set for January 4th, 1832 on the island of Bonny. King Pepple's palace burst into flames, following a series of explosions occurring around the island. The palaces of other smaller kings and chieftains that reside on the island also went down in smoke. The loss of several governments and administrative buildings were attributed to gunpowder-based sabotage. The mastermind behind this plot was discovered to be Prince Pepple, brother of the now ailing king, who had his own interests on the island kingdom in general. A month later, on February 3rd, 1832, an armed insurrection bloodied the streets of the island of Bonny. Rebels, armed with machetes, cutlasses, spears, and other close combat weapons, stormed the remaining government's buildings and offices attacking a lot of the Europeans and their supporters stationed there. Prince Peppel himself brought up a firearm division behind the unruly rebel mob and had his men fire indiscriminately into the citizenry, then causing more conflagrations around the island. This was not just restricted to the island itself. Several small EJAR raiding ships approached British ships offshore the beaches of the island, 
They stormed the decks, initially catching the crew by surprise, even managing to reach Captain Stuart Parry on his ship, and severely wounding him, causing him to die infirm seven days later. Meanwhile, on the mainland, Prince Pepper was leading his forces towards where his older brother was located, intending to seize power and likely establish himself as the new Ibani king. His forces then got surrounded as he pushed deeper into the island, with both British and local security forces surrounding them, firing into the mob, leaving only 30 survivors of the mainland attack left. And after a few hours, the assailants of the various British ships berthed offshore were killed. Prince Pepper was taken into custody, and since he attacked British forces, the local British consulate demanded he be tried by a drum head court, also known as a kangaroo court. This meant that Prince Pepper's crimes were already set in stone, and his sentence was already known. It was basically a court that was for show more of a spectacle for the people and for the king himself. King William acquiesced to their demands, and this is the last that history hears of the prince, and it is more than likely that the court found him guilty and had him executed. This was a signal to the various West African kingdoms off the Bight of Bonny and the Bight of Biafra, that the British were slowly taking more control of the region, and the relationship with the British Empire would forever be changed. Things would get even worse as the health of King William declined, further becoming more unfit and making large demands of his subjects that bordered on unreasonable, making it even harder for the nobility and the British consulate to deal with him. By 1852, the king would have a stroke, sealing his fate for the next few years, as the British consulate felt that for their interests to be served in Ibani, the king would have to be removed from his seat of power, undermining the notion of divine authority that the people of Ibani had been used to for centuries. Previously, if a king had to be removed and changed, it had to be by the will of the Dewaris, and now their power had been undermined by a foreign one. As a further show of power, it was the British who installed a replacement for King William. With his sibling, Dapu Fubara II Pepel, colloquially referred to as Dapo, was placed as a puppet king, but he suddenly died on August 13th, 1855. Following this, the acting British consul of the Bight of Biafra, J.W.B. Lynn Slager, appointed several chiefs to the position of regents in the area in order to decentralize the power of the houses. This backfired as a civil war erupted between several houses, specifically the Manila Pepple House and Annie Pepple House destabilizing the region and harming trade in the Bight of Bonny, and threatened to spill over into the Bight of Biafra, where the British were constructing new ports. The situation was only stabilized when the British restored King William to the throne in 1861, who swiftly curtailed the other houses and brought them in line. However, this peace only lasted five years, as William passed away in 1866. Succeeding him was George Ribigi Pebble, who was a devout Christian and enacted several policies to do away with the historical religion of the kingdom. The iguana, the sacred animal, was now being replaced with images of Jesus on the cross, which improved his relations with the British powers but severely soured relations 
with the other great houses of the kingdom. Unlike his father, George Pepple was unable to pacify the houses, and another civil war started again in June 1867 between the Manila and Annie houses and their supporters. To quell this, George marshaled his own forces quickly and captured the leaders of both factions, threatening both with execution if they did not stop this conflict. This only succeeded for two years, as in 1869, both houses launched massive campaigns against each other, forcing George to choose the Manila House side, banishing the Annie House leader, and planning to install a replacement. Unexpected to George, Chief Jubo Jiboga, the leader of the Annie House, seceded and founded the kingdom of Opobo. This devastated the economy of Ebani, as the new kingdom of Opobo controlled all the lands that had access to the palm oil, planning to keep it from both the Ebani and the British. To this end, on March 16th, 1870, George himself sailed for England to request the use of gunboat diplomacy to reopen up the palm oil trade. At the same time, with the loss of a hugely profitable region and a popo being too well defended to go against, the Ibani Kingdom had to quickly expand their territory for their economy and find good trading spots. The Ibani Kingdom then started to take over the rivers, controlled by the Calabari Kingdom, which was a fellow Ijar Kingdom. Naturally, the Calabari Kingdom were not going to take this lying down, and formed an alliance with the Opobo Kingdom to push back the Ibani. The Ibani Kingdom managed to secure allies for this war by calling on the nearby Nembe Kingdom and the Okrika, with their naval experience, to clash with the Calabari and the Opobo. The British then intervened in 1873, sending a series of gunboats to end the conflict. Up until 1879, things were peaceful in Ibani. King George himself fell ill and decided to visit England after recovering to generate political goodwill there for increased support. While he became famous in English newspapers, he pushed for British assistance to allow him more power and thus wrest control from some of the other houses to prevent another secession crisis. This would not be taken well, as when King George returned to Ibani aboard British steamships, there was another revolt that almost took the life of King George, if not for the British guards stationed near him. When the war between the various Ichar kingdoms broke out again, and the British had to send in gunboats to intervene, it had become clear to the consulate that King George could not hold on to power, and his reforms had been pushed too quickly to ensure stability in the region. Like his father before him, the British removed King George Pebble from power in 1883, once again hoping for a coalition of region chiefs. This did little to stop the Manila House leader, Okojombo, from falling out with the other houses once again. To segue into what comes next, we need a brief history of Okojombo. Born the son of a slave, he won his freedom and eventually gained enough power to become a lesser chieftain. He was able to see the way the winds were blowing and became a highly successful trader, granting him massive amounts of wealth. Through this notoriety, he was adopted into the Manila House, becoming one of its leaders, and when the king died in 1855 and the regency was created by the British, Okojombo was able to use his influence to set things up so that the various regents had to serve and report to him. 
but Hako Jumbo did not hold as much power as he would have liked. When the official head of the Manila House died in 1863, Hako Jumbo and his intra-house rival, Banego, could not agree who should rule the house. The two came to a compromise by installing a puppet leader named Waribo, while the two split the loyalties of the house and its holdings between them, constantly vying against each other for supremacy of the house. Even when George Peppel became king, Okojumbo viewed himself as equal in power to the king, as he was the wealthiest man in the Ibani kingdom. While he initially supported George Peppel, he slowly tried to branch out, ignoring the king's summons and demands more frequently when he wa launched a civil war against Jabo Jaboga of House Annie. The final straw that eventually caused Jaboga to form the kingdom of the Pobo was a raid that Okojumbo led against workers and members of the Ani household. Okojumbo had used his wealth to purchase several 32-pound Karanets cannons. His target was outside the Ibani kingdom, where Jaboga had relocated his house, as King George had demanded that conflict no longer result within his kingdom. With these cannons, Okojumbo in 1869, fired on the entire estate and household, burning everything to the ground, and killing several Annie house members in a single night raid. Surprisingly later, Okojumbo made peace with Jaboga in 1873, even with the presence of British gunboat diplomacy looming over them. He struck an alliance with Jaboga, now known today in the history books as Jaja, as he noted that King George was trying to centralize power using Christianity, and thus backtracked on his support of the removal of traditional religions. By 1877, he was flaunting his adherence to traditional faith and culture, sticking to wearing elegant traditional clothing and going barefoot in public. He always had a large maritime retinue, and while he pushed back against British culture, he still sent his two sons to get an education in England. Not much is known what happened between Okojumbo and Jaboga, but they had another falling out that drove them to each amass armies, totaling between 7,000 to 8,000 men stocked with rifles, carronades cannons, and well-supplied heavy munitions Bought from the British. Thus the conflict resumed, which ended up harming a lot of British people stationed in the area. This was what caused the British Empire to depose King George, believing him incapable of reigning in Okojumbo. The British did little better, as Okojumbo openly fought with the other houses, whether they be Duwari or chieftains. By January 1885, Okojumbo attempted to seize the throne from his fellow regents and install his son as the new ruling monarch, but the other houses repelled his attempt. Deciding to appeal for British support, he made a trip to England where he introduced himself as the actual King of Ibani, though the papers at the time called him the King of Bonnie. Uncle Jumbo would meet his son, Herbert Jumbo, in England, and the two had a falling out. The son, fearing for his life, placed himself under British protection from his father. After this, Uncle Jumbo made a return voyage to England, but his ship got wrecked off of the West African coast. Uncle Jumbo survived the shipwreck and made it back to the Ibani Kingdom. By 1886, the winds were blowing badly for Ibani, as they saw the results of the British Empire slowly taking over other parts of West Africa by force. Knowing that they could not defeat the British Empire, they opted to sign a treaty, becoming a protectorate kingdom that still exists today in Nigeria. One of the caveats that the Ibani kingdom asked for 
was that King George Pepple be returned to the throne and Uncle Jumbo be publicly disgraced. The British agreed and Uncle Jumbo had to hand all his power to his son. His ambitions of rule died with him in 1891, along with his rival Jaboga, who had been exiled to the Canary Islands at this time due to other historical reasons. He survived King George, who had passed away in 1888. This time, with King George, Okojumbo, and Jiboga gone from the playing field, the region system was able to properly work without much conflict occurring. The regions would then appoint a central king, but it was mostly a figurehead position. Their compliance with the British especially with the discovery of oil, allowed for the wealth of the Ibani kingdom to grow again thanks to the oil boom. By following the region system strictly, the kingdom retained a lot of political power and autonomy, even after the creation of the Protectorate of Nigeria in 1914. The Ibani kingdom, today, now has a proper king, with current king Perikule the 11th ruling the now democratic kingdom. Blah, blah. This time, with King George, Okojumbo, and Jiboga gone from the playing field, the region system was able to properly work without much conflict occurring. The regents would then appoint a central king, but it was mostly a figurehead position. Their compliance with the British especially with the discovery of oil, allowed for the wealth of the Ibani kingdom to grow again thanks to the oil boom. By following the region system strictly, the kingdom retained a lot of political power and autonomy, even after the creation of Nigeria in 1914. The Ibani kingdom now has a proper king again today, with Perikule XI ruling the kingdom in the now democratic and independent Nigeria. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you like this episode and want more, please feel free to list it in the comments down below. Next episode will be focusing on various myths of the Igbo people, as that is how the series will go. A history episode, followed by a myth episode, and vice versa. See you around! Like, comment, and subscribe.